How you guys doing? Chris Ignato here, and do I have a surprise for you? So tonight, I'm meeting up with Evan and Harrison from the Wildlife Brothers and Jack and Gage from Jack's World of Wildlife. I mean, these are four people that are extremely intelligent who run some really great channels on YouTube. I really like these people and I'm really excited. However, my brain is working at like 30% capacity right now. Over the past 48 hours or so, I got sick and it really knocked me through a loop. It's not the coronavirus. And you know, I, I only get sick once every like 15 years or so. This thing has made it so I can't concentrate, hold a conversation. My arms and legs are super weak and I feel like I feel dead tired yet full of epinephrine or something. So yeah, that's fun. Needless to say, I'm extremely intimidated about tonight because I'm not gonna be able to keep up with these people intellectually, I imagine. And, uh, but it's gonna be really cool. It's probably gonna be a long video because we're gonna be setting up lamps and you know checking out lots of invertebrates and stuff. And I'm just gonna kind of film them, you know, and, and improvise this whole thing. So hope you guys enjoy it. And uh, let's get the show started. How you guys doing? My sir, better now. <laughs> Something I love showing people about the brown prinids is the fact that their eyes are practically touching on top of their heads, wrap all the way around the sides, and almost touch on the underside of their head. I mean, that's like, that's gotta be 360 degree field of vision. Incredible. In. But I don't blame him, because we just picked him up. He came to see what this light source is, and I picked him up. Some big giant grabbed him, and he reacted the way he should have. He bit the heck out of me. But take a look at that gorgeous insect. And he needs those mandibles, because this is a wood boring beetle. Uh, I'm here with Jack's World, Jack's wildlife. World of Wildlife. <laughs> yep. And uh, we got Gage, Jack, yep. and of course, None other than the Wildlife Brothers. How's it going? And uh, what we're going to be doing is going around doing some entomology and seeing what there is to find tonight. Hopefully it will be pretty good. I mean, we put up the, the mercury lamp at around 9.30. We got a lot of stuff already. Usually it doesn't happen until around 11.30 mm -hmm. or midnight. So things are looking promising so far. Little do we know it's going to be dead from this moment on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Let's hopefully. Hope <laughs> Fingers crossed, we're going to find us some fishing spiders. And with some luck, we'll have Dalamides tenebrosus and hopefully Triton, because those guys rock. And, uh, but say hi, guys. And, hi, guys. Uh, hi. Hi, guys. What did you guys find today? Check this out. Um, yeah, we, we caught a ton of long-tailed salamanders, which yep. is awesome. But uh, just before we made it down to this part of PA, we actually filmed with a ton of hellbenders, which was like all the way high up on my list. Beautiful, amazing, gigantic salamanders. And who knows, that video may be out before this video, it may be out after this video, but you'll have to go over to my channel to see either way. Yeah, yeah. So, yep. yeah. And on our end, we were just waiting for you guys to show up mm -hmm. so we can do some of the invert stuff because that's one of our passions, one of your passions, all Absolutely. three of you guys. So mm -hmm. we're going to get after it tonight for sure. Oh, yeah. show. Sure. So we're going to go along, and uh, if you guys are lucky, we'll actually find some cool stuff. But, let's see. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, no, I might get bite number three here. It sounds like a cone head. Yeah, oh, it's a cone head. I was going to try to grab this thing, but this thing is scary. Yeah, but what, get, it, get a close-up of uh, its face so you can see those black spots, and then that, that way you can identify, you know, ID it when you get home or something. I'm gonna go out of seek and just get some photos. Yeah. Smart. Smart. Okay, go for it. So, as I need to get them onto my other hand to get my flashlight off, but here's a beautiful cone-headed katydid, the species I'm personally not sure of. Do you know, Chris? 
No, you usually got to look at the base of the antenna, and there's these black spots, and I'm not that good. But we can definitely get a more positive ID on what species of cone-headed Katie did. But a lot of times, people will mistake the, uh, the sounds that they make for crickets. Yeah. But actually, a lot of the insects you'll hear calling at this time of year are actually Katie did's, like this guy. Oh, yeah. And you can see where they get the name conehead. That refers to a group of katydids, not just a species. But he has that adorable little unicorn horn there. One of the many cool insects we're hoping to show you tonight. Take a look at that yeah. guy. No, okay. it's on game. Right on to game. <laughs> we need you to sit, dear. I know. Come on, dear. Come on. Come on, dear. It's, uh, I think what happens with a lot of these they super don't like the sensitive oils. insects, yeah, no, the yeah. oils and the salt my, on your skin. Yeah. My like, oily teenage face, even though I'm 20. Yeah. Um, See, I got that Sicilian it. olive oil going. That's right. <laughs> Come here, you. Yeah, like gorgeous I, I, species. I get so much trouble with these. With anything with big old antennas, it just refuses to, to climb on. Yeah, isn't that weird, though? Yeah. I mean, they 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 they're tracking it. They're, yeah. They they can tell. And yeah. they she's mostly, cleaning her feet too now. She's going <laughs> gross. Yuck. They're mostly feeding on on what leaf material out there. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, but I think I mean they're, they're a reverse. lot of the, a lot of the is, um are, are pretty omnivorous. So I mean, they'll even take you know small soft-bodied invertebrates uh, if, if they happen upon them. Now she's striating her <laughs> abdomen a bit. He. He, he. bro. Oh yeah. He's striating his abdomen a bit there. That's how they call. They don't call from their mouths, from their heads, anything like that. They rub their wings. Will you do it? Their legs and their wings. It's got Super loud stuff. earlier, sitting yeah. up on top yeah. of the world. Yeah, seriously. Here we go. Nothing. Come here. I love oh, Katie Dids. Really yeah, nice Katie Dids. They're kind of like the modern the version of grasshoppers. Oh, yeah. No more profanities? No more profanities. All right, all right. Okay, so we've got a mantid fly. Is it okay if I talk? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, go for it. So we've got a mantid fly here. And uh, sorry it's kind of silhouetted, but this is a white sheet, so that's how it goes. But if you look at the shadow, you can see those formidable forearms that are used for snatching up its prey, as it's doing right now, and it can begin to chow down. Now, what's really cool about mantid flies is the fact that they're a perfect expression of convergent evolution. Those look just like praying mantis arms, although they fold in a different direction than the mantises do. And they both are completely unrelated species. However, they serve the same purpose. Sometimes necessity is the best mother of invention and efficiency can sometimes be reached as the same destination via different routes. And if I may, we have a perfect example of that with a true mantis right here in hand. So you can see how similar these two animals are in their body structure. They do, you can actually see her, look at her, or him reaching out with those perfect arms there. Look at that. How amazing is that to see two animals that really do look quite similar, even though they're completely separate species, different families even. Yeah, that is too cool. Perfect. Look at those both next to each yep. other. Wow. Yeah, obviously. Yoink. <laughs> I know. Mantis is, oh, oh, oh no. <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh. <laughs> Our mantis fly play. lives another day. <laughs> Indeed. She didn't even Whoop. skip a beat. There she is. That's awesome. And look at those black eyes. Uh-huh. I have yet to figure out why their eyes turn black at night. I thought it was humidity. I thought it was temperature. Um, I've experimented with those at home. Um, not perfectly, but pretty well, and none of them played an influence. Uh, just the time, just the hmm. time. I've turned out my lights indoors, their eyes stayed green. I don't know what it is that causes their eyes to turn black. Same thing goes on with the katydids. Uh, during the day, their eyes will be red. At night, they're black. In some cases, they're green. <laughs> Jumped right, right on onto the Chris's the camera. camera there. Look at that. <laughs> Come here, sweetheart. Okay, so far so good. Um, we stopped by the these two little ponds and we found six spotted fisher, mm -hmm. the Dalmedes triton, and we haven't found any tenebrosis yet. 
but we probably will. In fact, and that's that's one of the main targets for tonight. And you can hear yeah. behind us American bullfrogs. Obvious. We knew we were going to come across the bullfrogs out here. Yeah, this yeah. is their home practically. They're here all the time. Oh yeah. But for for myself, I'm looking for more fishing spiders. So I'm thrilled with the Dolomites Triton, the six spotted fishing spider. Yeah, those things are awesome. They're one of my favorites because they're so they're just vibrant and beautiful looking. Absolutely. You know? Um, the tenebrosis, I, I think, fingers crossed, I really think we'll find one tonight, but I'm betting we're not going to find it at water. No? I, I just sort of feel that way. They, I noticed in the last, like, seven years, I've been seeing them farther and farther from water. They are one of the few fishing spider species that I know of that will venture real far away from yeah. water. They're almost woodland dwelling at a certain point. So, yeah, we'll take a look around, but I'm feeling good. Yeah, yeah, so far so good. So, uh, see you in a second. They got rid of uh, Pantherophis spiloides. Yeah, that's really stupid. It's now, if, if I understand it correctly, um, it's Alleghenyensis. Up here, it would be Alleghenyensis, and, and through most of the East Coast, the black ones are Alleghenyensis. Quadra vitatus is in Florida, the what we would call a, a yellow rat. Obsoletus is anything west mm -hmm. of the Mississippi. What did Spencer call them again? What did he have? He name? called them, he called a gray rat snake. A la no, a Texas rat snake. Oh, right. it a he called it a Laffe obsoleta, and I haven't heard a Laffe used yeah, for old, North American snakes in a while. Will not switch from a yeah, I, I don't know yeah. their evolutionary <laughs> timeline, so to say, mm -hmm. but like Lipidoptera, mm -hmm. they've been around for 190 million years, right? And then butterflies mm -hmm. have been around for about 100 million years, mm -hmm. and um, but they have ears that predate, way predate bats. So those ears are most likely to, you know, let them know about birds mm -hmm. and pterosaurs. Mm -hmm. So that's, to me, that's pretty awesome. That is super awesome. Can you imagine You're trying to defend against a little ramparinkoid or something? Like this, not That'd this exact crazy. one, but mm -hmm. contemporary with pterosaurs. That gives you an idea of how old this lineage really is. Absolutely. And how really successful is. these animals Absolutely. were to, to have persevered through... So many time periods yep. that As we like everything say, was out to get These them. guys are true evolutionary masterpieces. That's why they've been able to persist for so long. And yeah. precisely why you see insects in completely different orders. Yep. Right. With the same uh, hunting structures. Absolutely. Yeah, you know who these guys Adaptation. are closer, closest related to? What group? Roaches. What, yeah, yeah, roaches. roaches. <laughs> That's basically a type of cockroach. Yeah. And you can tell if you look at their look thorax at their head and, and everything. Their and stuff, it looks roachy. Yeah, it does look Yeah, roachy. just like a thinner incarnation. Yeah. Yeah, they are fascinating. And you can Truly. really see that lineage really kind of bust out in some of those flatter, like, bark mantises and things like right. that mm -hmm. that are just so much more squatty looking. You're like, oh, that really does look like a roach. Huh? The sheep yeah. is obviously seen some things. Just get some hey, roll of like cool Guys, I think we got a mutation. What? I think we have a mutation. How can you tell? Oh, the double nose? Yeah, dude. Oh, that's crazy. Dude, get that. that oh, if, wow. if that's a mutation, that's going to be rare. You want me to get okay, look at this, guys. We think this is actually a mutation. That looks to be a double nosed moth. And so normally they're going to have that one protrusion from the face. But it looks like this one has actually got two of those little protrusions. So, I think that's a pelvis. Pelvis. Um, I mean, I hope I'm right. I've never known about them having two of those. I know. I've never seen one with two protrusions. Right. Regardless, it's it's something new to me. Yep. Yeah. I'm gonna put my hand on the other side to see if I can stabilize it a bit. Yep. There Good we call. go. Cool. Dude, what's up with that? Oh, I just made it worse. Oh. Now it's like break dancing. <laughs> dancing. <laughs> <laughs> this is a fiery searcher, and it's one of my favorite beetles of the region, second only to the dogbane leaf beetle. These things are amazing. They're big, they're super fast, and really ferocious. What makes these beetles one of my favorites is their stunning iridescent exoskeleton. This is filled with rainbows. Just look at how sharp those jaws are. You can tell they deliver even a worse bite than the prionid. Being a member of the caterpillar hunters, 
These beetles use those super sharp jaws to make short work of caterpillars and possibly other insect larvae. And uh, so I'm driving back up and you can't see elephants like driving. Like we had our powerful flashlights on, the headlights and things. You can't see them like from here to this fence is the closest you'll see them before, you know, you're like up on them. And if you're going like, you know, you know, 40 kilometers an hour, you know, even right, slow, you're, you're on top of them. Yeah. So, but this, um, this they, what they do is they like kind of mow maybe about uh -huh. eight foot on each side of the road. And so the elephants browse in the vegetation. Right. So it's like. The road is maybe 10 feet wide, like, you know, two lane, you know, two lane further, road, and then, you know, eight feet wow. off the road is usually where the elephants are. But we're driving back up, and all of a sudden, I, my first was like, we see the silhouette, the elephant's moving away from us, but he's on the left-hand side of the road, which side of the road you're driving on in Thailand. And so I'm thinking, okay, this is the same one that's already, you know, you know, you basically it. said it's had enough of us, you know, so I'm thinking we're about to cop a U-turn, but Gage is on... Uh, the back of my buddy's bike, and he was in front of us, and he just goes, zoom, and zooms up right past it. Well, at this point, the elephant hears him going by and turns perpendicular with the road, and he takes up the entire left-hand right. lane. And I'm still, you know, just kind of like idling forward towards the elephant, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I go, you know, I, I'm like, this is a life or death situation here because I, this isn't like passing a car. Like, I have to get up and around this elephant or turn around fast enough to where, you know, he can't get to me. So I, I'm like, I just slam on the acceleration and like pull over to the right hand side and I just remember hearing a scuff on the road and elephants, they just, they don't make a sound when they walk because those toes right. come in and then they've got that giant pad right. and that pad will like mold around like sticks and stuff. Like they'll sneak up on people and kill them in like parks in India and stuff right. because they can just walk completely silently. I hear that scuff on the, on the thing and I look back and I just remember in the red light of my little motorbike, that elephant's head was right here. Whoa. No, it was like trunk, a foot away I mean, from trunk me. balled up, was, like like ears all the way out. I thought he was dead. <laughs> and was it, was, like, it was right after I got this tattoo, and this is like, like some monk tattooed me in Thailand. Oh, and this, cool. this tattoo is supposed to like protect warriors in battle, like you can't be killed if you get this tattoo or something. And so I rode up, and, and they're both like, I mean, like they've seen a ghost, because I almost just got flattened by the elephant. And I just go, I'm immortal! And they're like, dude, you're so messed up that you almost got flattened by an elephant and you're just like woo yeah, <laughs> it's like you should be celebrating yeah, I'm oh, like man. yeah I was like whoo that, that was the good. elephant see that's what that's why I love this I, I like the yeah. okay guys so here we have a type of plume moth right and they look kind of like a, a T capital T they're pretty neat um, these wings kind of unfold to enable them to fly and there's different kinds of plume moths. My favorite is the artichoke plume moth. And actually, here's another species of plume moth right here. See how the legs on this one have little spines coming off them? The other species didn't, did it? So there's a bunch of different types of plume moths. And I see them all the time, so I never think to film them or talk to people about them. But pretty cool. They don't look like they could fly, do they? But they can. So I want to show you a moth that I really like because it's green. And you don't see a lot of green moths. But um, it's a type of geometrid moth. And I want to talk about that really quick. Geometrid moths are named after their caterpillars. And geometrid translates to earth measurer. And they move like an inchworm. Okay? So ancient stories have it that these, these inchworms or geometrid caterpillars would slowly measure the earth inch by inch, working their way around the earth. How cool is that? But check this out, Southern Emerald uh, Geometric Moth. And I remember that because I don't see them often and they're pretty because they're green. Now this is a type of longhorn beetle, kind of in the sawyer group. Um, I think it's a pine sawyer. I'm pretty sure it's a pine sawyer. Monocamus. Gallo something, what was it? Gallo Provincia, Provincialis, yeah, Gallo Provincialis, if it's a pine sawyer. And, uh, well, it obviously is a type of longhorn beetle because of those long antenna. That's how they get the name longhorn beetles, those super long antenna. And these can be a timber, these can be sometimes a nuisance to the timber industry. Some of them go for living wood, some go for rotting, decaying wood. You know, standing wood, 
logs, you know, various species have different preferences. I love the longhorn beetles. I think they're really impressive and cool to look at, but I don't own a timber business. So, the kind of comments that Gage just casually drops in conversation are priceless. You know, and they all pertain to his, like, life or experience. You know, like, um, you know, the, the, the most pain I ever had was that time that the, the semi had slowly rolled over me when I was trying to pull the cobra fang out from my big toenail, you know? And, um, but it was cool because I used the fang to, to make a tattoo gun and that's how I got this cool tattoo here up with this monk drinking, you know, chai tea and somewhere in Nepal. You know, he just, he throws these comments out and they're true. That's the thing, they're true. I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh no, yeah. I remember my first Cobra Fang tattoo gun too. It's impressive I got head butted by a tiger once. Really? Yeah, that hurts. I don't have any wolf spiders. She shows me the container. It's a Brazilian wandering spider. Oh my it's god. It's Phonutria fera. Not, not boliviensis or anything. Um, How do people pre, pre-COVID, my, like my resting heart rate was like 55. You know, I, I was phenomenally wow, healthy. I used cool. to be a diver, swimmer, gymnast. You were um, gymnast. Mm-hmm. I had a, a Siamese crocodile clamp onto my boot one time. But I didn't... Yeah, I was in the circus. Um, I used to like ride the elephants in, like holding up plates on like 20 foot sticks and all that stuff. And, wow. That was always exploitative, but really cool. And I mean, all the elephants, from remember. what I remember, I was a child, but from what I remember, everything was in phenomenal shape. Were they? It would, it would like outmaneuver me, and it would go straight for my stomach every single time. You've been um, hand, you were hands on with it. Yeah, I had to be. And like I said, I've worked with you know Bungaris. Caliophis, yeah. Oxyuranus, uh, some of the deadliest you know, snakes on the planet, Dendroaspis, nausea, all of yeah. that. But oh man, mm, yeah, and, that and was eerie. That was just now, and the premonition, you know, the having premonition, a dream like about a black yeah. snake attacking you, having the phantom like, and that's touching. weird for you as a yeah. snake lover. Yeah, I right. love snakes. The robust toxin is pretty similar to caliotoxin found in, Biver in Caliophis bivergatus. It's a voltage gate sodium channel modulator. Whereas, you know, Biver Goddess, you know, turns all of them on and completely inhibits the ability to turn off uh, Atrax is a little, little less bad. Um, it turns a lot of them on and then it slows the deactivation of the sodium channels. But it, I mean, it could very well kill you. In no way, I'm a I've never met anyone that's around. as good as handling venomous snakes as me or Jack. I mean, Chris, Chris and David. Yeah. Like, like friends out of country that we would be like, okay, you, they could right. maybe handle this animal. Okay, so I am in way over my head. These guys are frighteningly intelligent. I am not even kidding. Over the past two days, most of the time, I just aim the camera at them and record them talking, forgetting that I'm supposed to be making a video out of this. You know, holy cow. <laughs> Their stories are so exciting, so cool. Their intellect is through the roof. And I am walking among gods at the moment, in my opinion. Small g. And uh, just wow. I, I want to apologize for such a long video. And this is only part one. I've actually broken this into two parts. And I assure you, part two will be more exciting and have more wildlife involved. More invertebrates and things. I didn't even record most of the amphibians because I'm just listening to these people talk and... Incredible people. The Wildlife Brothers, Jack's World of Wildlife, two amazing channels I highly recommend you subscribe to, but actually talk to these people. Comment on their videos because it's the conversations that are unforgettable. So thank you so much for watching so far. I hope you don't mind it being a long video and I guess it'll weed out the people who are really excited about learning about nature versus people who just want to see like what's it called show me the creature move on because this is a video for intellectuals in my opinion <laughs> thanks so much for watching i'm chris ignato and i'll see you very soon in part two hopefully <laughs> <laughs>